Hello and welcome back to the Fruit of Grisaia Magnus route. In the last episode, Yuji came home after delusing his pursuers from the Ichigaya organization and only to find that Makina wasn't in the room of the love hotel that they were staying in. Realizing that she had gone back to proclaim the, the apple seedling that they got from the students at Mihammer Academy long ago, Yuji went after her. However, only to find that Makina had encountered two investigators and had been shot trying to take them out and was hospitalized due to the shock and is now in an unknown condition. We finished off as Yuji began to set a plan in motion, a plan that would hopefully solve everything out. Let's continue. Hey Chief, aren't you hungry? Let's get something delivered. Hello, ma'am? Are you asleep or what? Oh, pipe down. I was just trying to think. What is it? I'm asking if you're hungry. Come on, let's order something. Uh, I think not. Easy eating would only make us drowsy. I'll give you a break at nine, so tough it out a little longer. Uh, no way. That's not for 45 minutes. I only had yogurt and a tuna sandwich for lunch, you know. I don't know and I don't care. Suck it up. Well, easy for you to say, Chief. The client treated you to Italian after that visit to Iris and Machina in the hospital, right? So lucky. I passed on the meal. Haven't had anything but a little soba by the station myself. Spare me the whining. Seriously? What a waste. Wait, so you drove up to some neighborhood sober stall in that bright yellow sports car, stood there slurping up noodles with that blinding blonde hair and expensive suit? That seems like it'll take some courage in its own, right? Cut the idiotic chatter and focus on your job. So you keep saying, but 1929 hasn't made any conspicuous movements in days, you know. Maybe he's just hightailed it overseas or something. No, definitely not. The man doesn't give up that easily. Okay, but Iris and Machina is in our hands now, right? What's 1929's final objective here? I wouldn't be losing so much sleep if I knew that. Not to say that I don't have my suspicions. I would say 1929's general objective is most likely the permanent liberation of Iris and Machina. Permanent liberation? Uh, sorry, but what does that mean? It means exactly what it sounds like. He wants to establish a set of circumstances in which Iris and Machina can live out the rest of her life as she pleases, free from all obstruction and coercion. And how on earth is he planning to make that happen? There are two plausible methods. Take Irisu and run for around for three years, or utterly destroy all of those who pose a threat to her. Wait, how is he supposed to take her anywhere? The girl's in her custody now, and more importantly, she's in a coma. Well, we call it a coma, but she has been waking up at night. and We don't have anyone posted to guard the hospital either. It wouldn't be possible to take her out if he wanted to. Why don't we have any guards posted? Well, the client didn't ask for any, you know. That's not much of a reason. I doubt they particularly care if she's carried off. It would be easier to arrange a convincing accident outside of the hospital, after all. Lovely. I really shouldn't have asked. But doesn't that mean 1929 is kind of at a dead end here? Were you even listening to me? I said there are two methods, didn't I? Um, but that's... We're talking about the Irisu clan here. You know, they're not going to run out of people to send after him, no matter how many he takes out. No matter how enormous an organization may be, it always has its weak point. The Irisu's weak point? I'm drawing a blank. An organization is a living thing. Generally speaking, you can kill any living creature by crushing its head. So, if you're talking about the Irisu clan's core, the brain, so to speak, it'd have to be Irisu Kiyoka. I'd say it's safe to assume that 1929 would be looking to assassinate her. That's incredibly serious. If you have that much figured out, why aren't we taking action right now? Are you really doing your job over there? We've had four-digit agents card guarding Irisu Kiyoka at a distance for the last two weeks. Huh? Seriously? Look about deployments on the computer if you don't believe me. 
Ah, uh, it's true. Two four digits and four three digits to boot. Quite the broiled sweet mint. I nearly just let that one go, but I think you probably meant royal treatment. Japanese big heart, yes? Look, you're two-thirds Japanese. Well, I'm one-third African, so there. What part of Africa? Inoshima? Inoshima? You have a problem with Inoshima? I'll kick your butt. <sighs> Let me take a rain check on, check on that one. What's the status of our defenses at Irisu Global Headquarters? Any abnormalities? Oh, right. At the moment, everything appears to be normal. All the multi-story structures in the area are clear as well. There's no guarantee 1929 will always use sniping as his method. Are they checking everyone going into that building? Uh, we've received a complaint in regards to that, actually. We are requiring an ID type card entry permit to get inside, and the subcontractors who come and go are really kicking up a fuss. Uh, wait, what? What is it? The team assigned to check the visitors isn't one of ours. Ah, yes, there seems to be a lot of back and forth going on upstairs. Sakuradaman's second mobile unit is in charge of the check ins now. Apparently, we've even set up a temporary joint investigation headquarters. What a giant pain in the rear. How do we get forced to that on us? The situation is dragged on for too long for us to be worrying about putting on our, out our own fires. Unfortunately, our internal affairs director and their public safety chief were classmates, the students, and absolutely despise each other. Ah, yeah, I've heard the rumors about that one. Isn't the safety chief married to an ex-girlfriend of our IA director? I really hope this doesn't turn into a pissing contest. Too many cooks cock up the sweet mitts, as they say. Japanese is such a funny language. This isn't a laughing matter. What are we going to do if 1929 really does kill Yurisukiyoka? Just to be on the safe side, I've planned out something for that scenario as well. Tell me though, which do you think works better? A dastardly terrorist from the north, or a dastardly terrorist from the east? You're planning to cover up 1929's crime? Well, if you'd like to bring the Irisu gi a gift basket and say please accept my sincere apologies for our dog's inexcusable behavior, you can feel free. Ah, good lord, no. And that's exactly why we're skipping meals to focus on our work, understand? Glue your face to that monitor and don't peel it off until I say you can. Ah, jeez. Yes, ma'am. At times like these, I can't help thinking, if only Asako was here. If Asako was still alive, she'd probably talk Yuji down in minutes. But then again, if Asako was still alive, it would never have come to this in the first place. Kazumi Yuji can't kill people. The trauma of his childhood and the words of his mentor stay, in his, stay his hand. But taking Irisu Makina from him may have pulled out that safety pin for good. Honestly, you left behind one hell of a nasty little memento, Asako. Ten minutes after forcibly commandeering the light van. I have the driver pull over and get out under the pretense of inspecting the vehicle, then inform him it's being confiscated as evidence. I explain that I have no legal authority to silence him, but it would be wiser to keep quiet and avoid possible conflicts with the Ministry of Defense by laws. When he nods, I promise the van will be returned in two days and hand him JP's card. This, I clarify, is actually an automated line. Just call the number, then hang up without saying a word, and within th 30 seconds a nice sturdy car will come and pick you up. The driver's face crumbles in relief as he accepts it with both hands. In any case, now I got myself a suitable method of transportation. Leaving the van, I borrowed at, the park at a parking deck connected to the movie theater, I buy a few plastic bottles of water at a convenience store, then head down into the nearby subway station. Not that I'm actually planning on using a train this time. Making my way to the coin lockers inside the station, I retrieve my personal belongings and Machina's apple seedling, then go to my knees and carefully water the plant. I haven't been wandering around aimlessly for the last two weeks. I've been moving around gathering information, looking for a way to break out of this dead-end situation quickly and decisively. There aren't many cards left in my hand, and among them, only one stands out as an efficient and practical play. Even so, I've been conflicted. Still am. There's a part of me casting around desperately in the search of the most peaceful possible solution, and a part of me hissing, you know the quickest way to end this, so get moving. It's not really much of a debate, I'm probably just hesitating. 
The person Asako raised me to be, a person who chose not to kill, is making his last stand against the vicious thing that's been sealed away inside me since I was a child. Even now I can feel the balance slipping little by little with every passing minute. This agonizing won't last much longer. Yeah, there's only one way to wrap everything up neatly, isn't there? I take out the backpack I stowed with the seedling in my locker and retrieve the small gun stashed away at the bottom. It's a double action automatic, takes 39mm bullets. Jamie me gave me the thing in a personal capacity for use as a concealed carry firearm, but I found the quirkiness of the firing sequence hard to get used to. It's been sitting in the bottom of my backpack for a very long time. I unlock and open the case, then take out the well-oiled body of the weapon, remove the double column magazine and fill it with ammunition. Returning the loaded mag to the stock, I pull the slide assembly back and push the first bullet firmly into the chamber, then release my, gri my grip on the squeeze cocker beneath the trigger guard. The firing pin promptly returns to the safety position. Honestly, what the hell am I supposed to do with this thing? <laughs> Still, I've got no choice but to manage. Slipping the small pistol in between my belt and waist, I return my backpack to the locker, then get to my feet with the potted apple tree in my hands. But first, better go reinforce my resolve. I, wake my, I make my way back into the subway station crowd, setting off with the seating, seedling against the flow of businessmen on their way home. About one hour later, I find Matsusawa psychiatric still and quiet. It's already well past visiting hours. As always, there aren't any guards or even observers posted in the areas. My infiltration consists of slipping in easily through a ground level emergency exit. I follow a hallway faintly illuminated by the neon glow of the sign above the door. An empty flight of stairs takes me to the third floor where I, where I make my way toward a secluded private suite. At the very back of the third floor, I glance at the nameplate Irisomakana hanging horizontally across the final door, then slide it quietly open with no hesitation whatsoever. Hey Markina, I'm back. This might be the last time I see you, so I brought your plan today. And well, okay, sorry, but I've made up my mind to kill your mother. Don't worry, I'll pull it off perfectly. I'll set you free. Oh, Papa. What, were you awake? Hey, Papa, you brought me the apple tree? Yeah, that I did. I've been watering it and everything. <laughs> Thank goodness, I couldn't stop worrying about it. Markina, you think you can make it out of the front of the station tomorrow evening? Uh, well, let's see. I guess I can make it as long as I can get up. By tomorrow evening, everything should be over. So, let's meet up and find ourselves some place to live together. Ah, right. Don't like the idea? Nah, that ain't it. But if I disappear, my little sister, Serena's not gonna make it. What are you talking about? Okay, well, my little sister's getting worse. She might die, and I guess they need my audience to save her. The hell's with that? I see. So that's how it is. So that's what's been keeping her alive since they got their hands on her, the bastards. Don't worry, I'll wrap up everything nice and clean. Just be waiting. Tomorrow, at 1800 hours in front of the station, I'll definitely have to come to pick you up. Yeah, gotcha. I'll be waiting. So make sure you come, alright? Yep, yeah, I promise. Okay, that's a promise. Back asleep already, huh? Well, now that I've gone and made her a promise, guess I'll have to keep it. If I were to disappear, who'd keep the girl safe? Who's going to protect a girl whose own mother wants to kill her? I wanted to make her into a woman who could stand on her own two feet even when I'm no longer there to support her, but there's no more time. They backed us into a corner. All I can do now is finish this as quickly and thoroughly as possible. I've sharpened my fangs, I've torn off my collar. Nothing left to do but charge at my enemy and rip out their throat. Changing into a plain workman's uniform from the back of my van, I head out onto the highway. The trip to Irisu Global Headquarters takes 40 uneventful minutes. 
I exit the highway a little early and quietly make my way to a local street that runs along the back of the Iriso headquarters. Within a few minutes, the service entrance comes into view ahead, marked only by a plain series of guidelines. As Sakura Diamonds currently object subjecting every vehicle to extensive security checks before leading it onto the ramp, ramp, there's a decent backlog of minivans and trucks lined up waiting to enter. I reach past the AC vent to flip my ha on my hazard, large, pull hazard lamps, pull one wheel up onto the shoulder so traffic can pass, and queue up at the end of the line. A police officer who's been watching my approach promptly approaches, his boots slapping noisily against the pavement. He's carrying a binder and a ballpoint pen in one hand. With the other, he knocks lightly on my side window. Could you stop your engine, please? Uh, yeah. Even as a sulky frown flashes across my face, I obediently reach down and twist my key in the ignition. Then lower the driver's side window and grab the entry per permit sitting on top of the dashboard and present it to the officer. The officer accepts the paper, slips it into his binder, cranes his head a little to check my license plate number, then begins scratching away till the gears some form or other. This part's a gamble. A calculated gamble, but a gamble nonetheless. Over the last few weeks I've been stealthily visiting the area around Irisu HQ at irregular moments, probing and observing security. About a week ago I realized that a mobile police unit had been placed in charge of inspecting all incoming deliveries. Until then, our people had been in charge, so I had been forced to keep a wary distance, but I'm willing to bet some political wrangling about Ichigai's earlier blunders resulted in the establishment of an extremely superficial joint investigation headquarters, with the cops taking over a few minor jobs like this. This sort of thing always the brainchild of someone at Kasumi Kaseki often results in cooperating agencies competing in an attempt to show off to said, to said bureaucrat. And even at best of times, Sakura Daman and my employer are on terrible terms, frequently neglecting to share even crucial for information. Healthy rivalries and in-house competition are all well and good, but when things get out of hand, you just end up sabotaging each other. Very convenient now that I find myself on the other side. Look, I don't know what you guys are supposed to be looking out for here, but how long is this gonna last? We're all busy people, you know. Yes, I'm aware. I'm just doing my job myself, right? I'm sorry, but I have to ask for your patience and corroborations. And on that note, mind, having, mind letting me have a look at your driver's license? Ugh. Clicking my tongue in irritation, I rest my right hand on top of the wheel and lean my upper body toward the passenger seat and open the glove compartment. Retrieving a light blue pass case, I take out the driver's license and hand it over. Of course, it's just one of the numerous cover IDs my company prepared for me in the days when we were on better terms. Okay, thanks. Could you remove your hat, please? The policeman checks the photograph on my license, then look up to compare it with my own features. Squinting irritably as he shines his flashlight in my eyes, I shove my face to forward for examination. Right, that's enough. Thank you very much. While carefully accepting the license back, I shoot a quick glance at my rearview mirror out of the corner of my eye. There's already quite a few new arrivals waiting behind my own van for inspection. One or two of them have begun noisily revving up their engines as if to say, get a move on. Yes, yes, just a minute. Grimacing at the noise, the policeman wedges the binder with my fake entry permit under his arm. Then bends down and pokes something that looks like a motorcycle rearview mirror behind the vehicle, examining the undercarriage. Looks like the forgery of the permit went fairly well. Four days ago, I managed to approach one of the trucks lined up here waiting to enter the, the warehouse. After presenting one of my company IDs, I asked to see their permit, which I then quietly photographed with a digital camera. With those images as a base, I used a PC in a net cafe in Shin, Shin Okopu to mock up a falsified document, then printed it out in a neighborhood coffee shop. Pretty half-assed job, but the cop doesn't seem to have any suspicious at the, suspicions at the moment. Okay then, alright, if I take a look at your cargo? Yep. Answering in the grouchy tone of a man who's having his time wasted, I reach to the side of my seat and yank up the lever that controls the van's hatchback. As the rear door swings upward with a soft hiss of extending dampers, the policeman sticks his head inside. Opening the lids of cardboard boxes one after another, he sticks his hand into the work uniforms packed inside, confirming that I'm not hiding anything suspicious inside. You're from a uniform company? Yeah, that's right. They're working you pretty late, huh? We're in the same boat here, right? Come on, please finish up already. It's gonna be a real pain if you mess up all the merchandise like that. 
Yeah, sorry for the hassle. Almost done. Come on, aren't you done yet? Get a move on! An angry shout from the driver of the next truck cuts through the air. Damn straight, let's get a move on here. If somebody from the company looks into that driver's license number, it's an instant game over. I'd really like to be on the ins be inside before that happens. Okay, that's all I need. Go ahead and move on to the ramp. The officer quickly pushes a small stamp twice on the document on his binder, then returns my forged entry permit, narrowing one eye I accepted with a curt nod. Right, thanks. Okay, next, move your vehicle forward and stop your engine. Guess the public sector is not all sunshine donuts and fat pensions, huh? Muttering these sympathetic sentiments to no one in particular, I start the van's engine, then guide it smoothly onto the engine ramp leading down into the basement of the Irisu Global Headquarters. Ma'am, do we have any idea how long these extraditionary security measures will continue? Numerous departments have informed us of delays in operations and many of the suppliers are submitting complaints. Hmm. Well, I did ask them not to make too much of a fuss about this, but it seems two public agencies coexisting in the same building is somewhat problematic. They are all tiresomely enthusiastic. This has been going on for a good two weeks now, ma'am. Should things continue like this for another ten days or so, we're going to begin incurring fairly significant losses. Yes, true, and I suppose my presence here is the cause. However, considering the situation with my daughter, I can't simply leave Japan at the moment. How very troublesome. Perhaps the two of you could take a temporary ship trip overseas. I suppose so. It has gotten rather chaotic over here, so that might be for the best. Is father's plane available? Yes, we can arrange for a flight by four in the afternoon tomorrow. In that case, please do so. I'll be taking both Machina and Serena with me, so contact the relevant hospitals and inform my mother. Certainly. Ah, while you're at it, pick out some vaguely appropriate gift for a sympathy visit to mother. Some sort of drapery, as always? Yes, that's fine. And some chestnut manju buns from Surya Sur as well, if you'd be so kind. I seem to recall your, that your mother dislikes red bean paste. I believe there was a rather heated fight when you brought her mooncakes as a souvenir. I remember, of course. Mother can't stand chestnuts either. Why else would I be bringing them to her? Of course, I'll have them prepared at once. I would appreciate that. Please excuse me. Uh, so tired. Well, holy shit, about time you came back. Where the heck you been? Don't got all day here now. Eek? What? Uh, who are you? Uh, don't you gotta freak out on me, miss. I'm just a delivery man. Got a package to rub off. A delivery? Wait, how did you even get up here? Huh? How the hell do you think? Said I had a package for the press. Lady at the reception desk says, well, go on and take, all, take it on and upstairs then. That can't be right. What receptionist told you that? What do I care? Anywho, I'm here to deliver this to the president. Directly to the president? Da. What's inside the package? Hell, I know. They just told me to deliver the thing. Probably just one of them baum coochies or what have you. Why baum? Would you mind if I looked inside? Fine by me, but it'd be on your own head. Arcing one eyebrow dubiously, Miss Sawada accepts the cardboard box and removes the lid. Huh? Inside are numerous heavy-duty nylon ropes, and on the top of these, there's a single scrap of paper. Don't make a sound or you're dead. Miss Sawada stares blankly at the words for a moment, her mouth hanging open slightly in bewilderment before raising her face to questioningly, questioningly to me. On um, this... What? You're illiterate? Don't make a sound or you're going to die. I pull out my handgun from the breast pocket of my work uniform, firmly depressing the squeeze cocker ready to fight, ready to ready the firing pin. Yeek! I said not to make a sound. Thrusting the gun forward threateningly, I use my free hand to remove the cap from my head and spit out the tissue paper that I had stuffed in my cheeks. Mr. Wada's eyes go wide in shock. You're Kasami Yuji. I was taught to laugh over woman's stupidity three times. But that was your last strike. The next time you make a sound, I'm going to kill you. Apparently sensing something in my dark, sunken eyes, Miss Sawada bites firmly down on her lower lip and proceeds to glare angrily up at me in complete silence. That a girl. 
I'm going to borrow this. Holding the gun steady in my right hand, I quickly reach out with my left and pull out a handkerchief that, I, that had been peeking out of the secretary's breast pocket. Give me an ah. Uh. What's wrong? Open your mouth. Come on. Ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. You've got no idea how ridiculous you look. Ugh. Just a joke. Don't get angry. Keep your hands on top of the desk. Don't go for the alarm button. I ball up the handkerchief and stuff it into Sawada's mouth, then fix the gag in place with the nylon rope from the box. <laughs> Stand up. Slowly come out from behind the desk. Put your knees on the ground and hold your hands behind you. Sorry, this might hurt a little, but tough it out. Miss Sawada seems to have decided that resistance would be pointless, as she obediently follows my instructions and wait quietly to be bound. Taking several more cords of nylon rope, I quickly tie her hands behind her back, link her angles together and finally connect the two bundles to immobilize her completely. That posture will probably get a little painful after a while. Why don't we lie you down? Slipping my hands under Sawada's armpit, I gently lower her sideways onto the thick carpet. The secretary squirms around a little after being appended, but once you're on the ground in this position, it's impossible to get back on your own power. Oh. Exhaling qu quietly, I review every step in the process that brought me here, searching for any potential oversights. Everything's gone pretty much exactly according to plan so far. Once I got inside, it was surprisingly smooth sailing. After following the ramp down to the d d delivery entrance at the very bottom of the tower, I hauled out the cardboard boxes from the back of my van and began to load them onto a large freight elevator. All well and good that I'd gotten this far, but now I had to come up with some kind of inconspicuous route upward. The final cardboard box in my arms, I was casually glancing in the direction of the emergency exit when I noticed another man in uniform working nearby. The man loaded a few crates from a panel where a van he'd presumably driven down here then wheeled his pallet jack into the ele elevator and slipped into the corner of the cage. You're not getting in? Taking the man's question as my cue, I followed him into the elevator and with almost a disappointing ease found myself rising to the third floor warehouse. My new colleague took off his hat and offered a brief greeting to the manager, then wheeled his delivery off into the maze of shelves with easy familiarity of a man in his own home. I imitated the man's slight bow toward the manager, then followed him into the depth of the warehouse with a nonchalant expression on my face. A little way inside, I stopped and took out a notebook from the pocket of my uniform, pretending to double-check where I needed to stow my package. Soon enough, the other man finished his own delivery and headed back out. Instead of riding the freight elevator back down, the delivery man simply said, Can you get the door, please? In response, the manager pressed a button to unlock a door leading to an external emergency staircase. The man nodded his thanks and slipped outside. Probably needed to go down a floor to get some documents signed. After briefly considering the matter, I decided to make use of the emergency stairs myself. A single sentence to the manager got me outside, but instead of heading downstairs, I climbed up to the fourth floor where an inviting door offered access to an internal evacuation staircase. The problem was opening it. An emergency exit is only intended to open one way. For obvious reasons, they are not designed to be accessible from the outside. But I haven't spent years on the Ichigaya payroll for show. I was taught a method that can get you inside one of these with a bit of delicate fiddling. A little time consuming, but it almost always works. However, even if it was possible to unlock the door, I couldn't just swing the thing carelessly open. An emergency exit of this sort has an alarm device active by default. The instant it opens, an ear-splitting bell goes off and the building security will instantly be contacted. As a countermeasure, I used the classic trick. Deceiving the alarm with a bit of aluminum foil. I took Markin's pack of grey flower flavoured bubble king from my pocket, unwrapped one stick and popped it into my mouth. Folding the wrapping paper into a flat sheet, I stuck the piece of gum onto, the, onto it as an adhesive and fixed it over the alarm sensor. After a few minutes of work on the door, I slipped quietly into the deserted evacuation staircase and without further difficulty went my way straight up to the 12th floor. Now it's just a matter of getting into the president's office, but... Whoops, that was a bit sloppy. Now that I look carefully, there's a fingerprint scanner next to the heavy wooden door in the in back with an LCD screen displaying lock in red letters. Come to think of it, Miss Sawada here had to unlock the door for me last time I visited. Should have had her open it before I tied her up. Now what? I glance back at the secretary, lying on the ground with her body arched back like a shrimp, only her face pointing this way. Could always just chop up a finger, but that's a bit much. Might make things awkward when you're getting intimate with your boyfriend. Can't have that. 
Pushing my gun into the belly of my work uniform, I haul Mr. Wada off the thick rug. Hype <laughs> down, I'm just going to borrow your finger for a second. Don't make too much noise or I'll just snip one snip off with that pair of scissors on your desk. <laughs> Lifting Sawada over my shoulder, I bring her to the door and guide her index finger of her right hand to the scanner. Okay, thanks, we're good now. Gently lowering the secretary back to the floor, I firmly grab hold of the doorknob. Do or die time. Possibly both. Pardon me. Kazami Yuji reporting in. Huh? Irisuki Yoka's eyes open wide with shock, a deep fried okake cracker freezing halfway to her mouth. Snagging in the middle of the night? You're going to put on weight, you know. I glance briefly at the corner of the scene. The surveillance camera activity light is normal. I'm willing to bet Irisu Kyoka deliberately turned the thing off to keep a midnight snack private. You! Why are you here? Why are you here? How did you get in? Women always ask the same questions. I pulled a small handgun out of my work uniform. My previous visit made it clear that further discussion is pointless. Today I've come to eliminate you as a threat to Irisu Makia. Eliminate? Look, let's just calm down for a moment. Sorry, not interested. Talking just makes the trigger heavier. I should have shot this woman dead the moment I saw, I saw her. I've already made this harder than it needed to be. Don't falter, Yuji. Pull the trigger. Now, before the momentum fades. Ugh. Sensing my momentary hesitation, Kyoka leaps forward, aiming for the door behind me. Damn it! As the woman tries to slip past my side, I swing an arm in a vicious arc, slamming the butt of my, of my pistol into her temple. Her body jerks backward. I sweep her legs from out, uh, out from under her and she tumbles to the ground. Ah! Did you just strike me? Yeah, that I did. Tell me something. Did your parents ever hit you? Never. I'd never been hit by anyone in my life, much less my parents. Figured as much. That explains a lot. What about it? That just means I've never made any mistakes worthy of a beating. That's a delusion, an egotistical fantasy. Your parents guided you around every bump on the, in the road, and when you tripped over, over your own feet, you found somewhere else, someone else to blame. You've lived your life in denial of your own shortcomings. You were chauffeur down a life others set out for you. Never spanked, never frustrated, never knowing pain. That's why you turned into a woman who could sacrifice her own daughter without so much as a twinge of conscience. What will a child like you know? What can you possibly understand about me? Oh, I understand. My father was the same way. The old man was a waste of space who spent most of his life eating through his inheritance. When he screwed up or things took a bad turn, he'd take it out on the people around him. He knocked me around to forget his troubles, thought every other person in the world was trash. Any living thing that he couldn't use to his advantage was worthless. Didn't even see us as human beings. Pissed him off just to look at us. This ringing any bells? Nothing but the prattle of a low life with an inferiority complex. You've got the same disease, and there's no curing it now. If I don't kill you, Magnus is going to die instead. Hold on, you're going to kill me for Magnus' sake? Listen, that would be pointless. Even if you kill me, there are many others who want the girl dead. That's not relevant. If anyone else comes to kill her, I'll eliminate them one by one, as many times as it takes. Fine. Alright, let's make a deal. Shall we spare my life and I'll make sure if Magnus comes to no harm? I know, if you'd like, why not marry Markinam? I'm sure it'd make for a much nicer life than being used up and thrown away by that bizarre organization of yours. Sounds nice. Always dreamed about that sort of thing. See? How about it? Let's do that. There's just one problem, though. I'd rather die than become your son. You know, I thought long and hard before I came here. I was very close to certain, but I tried to convince myself there was a s the slightest chance you cared about Markinam as a mother. I mean, come on, having to settle things through killing, it's just too damn sad, isn't it? Yes, of course, there's no need for that. Spare my life and no one will have to die. Listen to what I'm telling you. I thought long and hard and this was the answer. I've reached my conclusion. My will isn't weak enough to be swayed by your words. That's enough. Just pull the damn trigger. Don't let the emotion cloud your mind any further. Pull the trigger now and everything will end. You won't have to fear the night any longer. Don't you remember what you came here to do? Why are you standing in this room, Kasami Yuji? What are you to Makina? I know. I am her father. I promised the girl I'd become her father. 
Wait, what are you talking about? Please listen, please stop this, don't kill me. What did I ever do to you? It's not like I killed Makina. If I've ever done something wrong, I, then I apologize. Please, please forgive me. I'm, I'll, I'm begging you, I'll do anything. Haha, <laughs> what an awful face. But I've got the feeling I've seen it somewhere before. Where was it? No, no more. Mom, you liar. Ah, oh, now I get it. She looks just like Machina. Well, of course she does. They are parent and child, after all. It's only natural, right? <laughs> hey, are you listening to me? Please! Shut up. So, this is actually where you are uh, to get the final choice in regards to whether you want the good ending or the bad ending. Uh, so there will be no more choices down Machina's route, which means that we are getting closer to the end of Machina's route. Um, as I've mentioned when I went into the branching part of the stories, we're going for the good endings. Now the good ending for Machina's route comes when you don't pull the trigger. Yeah, that's right. This woman is not worthy to be called a mother, but they're still parent and child. And when you kill your parent, even if they're the scum of the earth, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. God damn it, this is no good. Now I'm remembering. I can't kill. <laughs> I'm no good. Uh, it's no good at all. What a joke. What a complete goddamn joke. What the hell am I doing? Falling flat onto my backside on the spot, I explode into roars of laughter. It's the briefest of chances, but Irizu Kyoka seizes it. As I laugh at the deranged bitterness of a man who's given up on the world itself, the woman's hand leaps for the alarm button under her desk. And in that moment, I really, truly don't give a damn about her, about myself, about anything in the world. There are hurried footsteps in the corridor within seconds, the sound of someone bursting into the secretary's office. Guess that's that. Well, for a piece of shit like me, I guess, it was pretty respectable showing. The thought fills me with something like resignation. My throbbing heart slows, the red-hot flame in the center of my mind grows cold and still. The guards in the office outside are throwing their bodies against the door, aggravated by its refusal to open. For some reason, their obvious irritation strikes me as somewhat amusing. Damn it! Twelve guards, bring the rifle slugs, hurry! So they're going to break the master key, huh? Yes, that means they're uh, probably not our people. Well, not that I particularly care at this point. It's a simple trick. Take a shotgun with a massive 12, ga 12 gauge ammunition and blast away the upper and lower hinges of the left, then the area by the lock. Not pretty, but it opens just about any door, hence the nickname. Soon enough, the door smashed violently inward. A man in black burst into the room shoulder first, leading with one leg like a charging martial artist, his automatic pointed to the ground. Help me! Kill the boy immediately! He's a terrorist! I see. They're going to turn me into a terrorist, huh? Jamie must be the one who prepared that scenario. Wonder if I'll be from the north or the east? Well, probably the north. Freeze! Drop your weapon! Drop my weapon, he says. Unfortunately, I already tossed my gun on the, on the floor before you came in, Rambo. Why the hell would I bother fighting back this late in the game? Just dispose of me of however you like. Yeah, gotcha. I'll be waiting. So make sure you come, alright? Oh shit. That's right. I promised Machina, didn't I? Sorry, kid. I screwed up. Don't think I'll be able to come pick you up. I really am sorry, Machina. Just kill him already! But he is not resisting. What does that matter? The boy assaulted me. Kill him! Take him into custody! The two security police have already placed themselves between me and Irisu Kyoka, completely sheltering her body. Wouldn't think the woman was bawling like a baby a minute ago. The instant she's standing behind someone's back, her voice gets a lot louder. That side of you really does remind me of my old man. <laughs> a weak laugh, tinged with self-mockery, pushes its way out of my lungs. The largest of the SP officers reaches out to restrain me, probably looking to grab my wrist, yank it behind my back, then press my chest to the floor with his knee. Ow. The instant that massive baseball mitt of a hand sees my right wrist with a bone-crunching force, I reflexively try to pull it free. Settle down, punk! Ugh. 
Circling behind me, the man strikes the side of my head with three-stage extendable baton, a tingling warmth spread in the back of my nose. That attitude pisses me off. He has power. I have none. I'm not even resisting. He still knocks me around. That's perfectly normal to him. It comes as naturally as breathing. And all of a sudden, it makes me very, very angry. My right hand twists instinctively in his, in his grip. I lean back, shifting my weight to my waist, pushing myself off of the ground. I jerk his wrist sharply upward as I turn to face him. Ah! Oh. Even as I exhale the air in my lungs through pursed lips, my left hand reaches for the man's eyes, but he's ready for it. His baton falls to the ground, his open hand catches my wrist. God damn it, you little... We've each got a hold of our wrist now. It's become a contest of strength. Against a muscle monster like this, a simple grappling match isn't going to end well. With a small twitch of my captured wrist, I abruptly let the muscles in my arm go slack, no longer resisting his attempt to overpower me. The man's torture lurches forward, destabilizing his body centers or his body centers of gravity. I don't give him a chance to regain his balance. Guiding his arm up and over my shoulder, I step forward, trying to use the weight of his unbalanced upper body as leverage for a throw. A little bastard! Know how to plant yourself. But guys who've done judo are seriously difficult to uproot. Abruptly changing tactics, I release my grip on his left wrist with a little jerk to the side. Again taken by surprise, he waves his hand in circles like a beginner on a balance team. Stop resisting! As I move to tackle my opponent, the SP who'd been hanging back to guard Kirisu Kirisukiyoke launches at me from behind. Quickly twisting around as we tumble across the floor, I lift my legs into the air, then push forward off my back and drive my toes into the onrushing officer's gut. <laughs> Using the backlash from my kick, I roll forward over the stomach and chest of the man who collapsed with me. The momentum carries me to my feet above the prone policeman. I instantly drop my knee down to his throat like the blade of a guillotine. <laughs> Maintaining the pressure, I frantically search for the gun I abandoned earlier, but it's already been kicked into a corner of the room. Much too far for me to reach out and grab. Near weapon. The man pinned underneath my knee seems a good option, but when I flip back his jacket, there's no gun strapped to his armpit. Must be a hip holster. Taking my tongue in irritation, I reflexively grab the golden ballpoint pen, peeking out from the breast pocket of his Oxford shirt. Don't move! The third of the Irisu Kyoka's defenders brings his shotgun to bear. You want to shoot? Go ahead. I grab the man underneath me by the back collar of his suit and tumble away, pulling his body with me as a human shield. God damn it! Doesn't matter if you've got a rifle slugs or double the old back box shot at this range, there's no way for him to shoot me without killing his comrade as well. No one from Sakura Daman would ever make that choice. In the first place, not relying on firearms except when strictly necessary is a point of pride in that organization. That's it, I've got three opponents. One of them may be out of the picture, but if I just sit here, the others will subdue me. What do I do? <coughs> While I'm stalling, the man I knock down with a kick to the solar plexus totters to his feet. There's no more time to hesitate. What do I do? As my eyes dart around the room, I tighten my grip on the human shield's color, bending his body backward like a bow against my knee. And in that moment, something slips out of his jacket and tumbles noisily onto the floor. See us, huh? It's a palm-sized spray can, almost looks like a plain, back, plain black bottle of deodorant at a glance. But the contents are without a doubt a... Okay. <laughs> That's a bit of a mouthful to say the least. Chlorobenzylatelmelononitrile, in other words, tear gas. I quickly pull up the can and fire a blast into the face of the approaching officer. <laughs> Although it certainly seems effective, it's not the kind of CS my company would be using. The chemicals sprayed out as a diffused mist, so it can't be used against opponent, distant opponent. Look out! Get back! Cover your nose and mouth with a handkerchief! But the gas right into the currents of the room's air conditioning begins to flow up toward Irisu Kyoka and her third guard. Struck suddenly by a plan of sorts, I jab the golden ballpoint pin in my hand into the side of the spray can with my, all my might. I instantly cover my nose and mouth with the cover of my work uniform. Tears are already pouring from my eyes in streams. Pulling out the pen from the canister, I hurl the little gas grenade at the man with the shotgun. What the? It's dangerous! Get down! Probably acting on pure instinct as an SP officer, the man throws Irisu Kyoko to the ground, covering her body protectively with his own. Now! 
I leap to my feet, mouth buried in the crook of my arm and bolt for the door. On the verge of escaping, I notice a large tabletop lighter in the shape of a goddess on the reception desk and reach out to grab it. <coughs> Wait! There's a the sound of a shotgun being pumped behind me. Now that I rip my shield behind, he has no reason to hold back. HALT! <coughs> An impact to my right shoulder, like the blow of a giant's hammer. My field of vision instantly dyed in shades of red. The bone-shattering shock travels through my skeleton, shaking my skull violently. The 12-gauge blast is powerful enough to explode capillaries across the right half of my body. Blood forced out of its vessels is gathering in my eyes. Tumbling forward through the door, I instinctively try to push myself up off the thick carpet. But my right arm is completely powerless. I collapse awkwardly to the floor. <clears throat> Lifting myself up a little with pure abdominal strength, I reach over to my right shoulder, or what's left of it. The muscle and flesh are simply gone. My fingers sink easily into the massive wound. It's fine. I won't die. There's no real reason to believe that. Unless I convince myself it's true, I'm going to fall to the ground and lie there paralyzed. It's fine. This is nothing. Just a scratch. Human beings don't die that easily. There's no problem here. Repeating the words in my mind like a mantra, I gather my willpower into a swirling vortex deep inside my gut. Stand up. I force my knees to push my body erect, but my legs shake like those of a newborn foal. I can't get to my feet. From behind the sound of a shotgun being pumped, Cold dread shoots through my spine. Looking over my shoulder, I find the man with the gun scrubbing his eyes vigorously with the cuff of his suit as he hacks and wheezes painfully. He's in no shape to line up a shot, but at this range, even a blindly fired warning shot could easily kill me. I bite down on my lower lip fiercely enough to draw blood, willing my convulsing legs to support my weight, begging myself to stand. I've got to hurry. Back up. Might arrive any minute. I have to get out of here. Now. Leaning heavily against the wall, I rise to my feet. Slowly, painfully, I leave the president's office behind, the cigar-lighting goddess tucked under my arm. Just be patient, Markham. I'll definitely come pick you up. Reaching the passage, I hold the statue to the fire alarm above and bathe it in a small blast of faith. Every emergency door in the building will be automatically unlocked when the fire alarm goes off. With this, is, with this done, I can slip in and out of any floor. After pushing my way onto the emergency staircase through the exit with the sensor I disabled earlier, I jam the enormous lighter in between the handrail and the door's lever, rendering it impossible to open from the inside. Got to get this patch up somewhere. Maybe the gunshot was too large a trauma to possess, but it really doesn't hurt at the moment. Some part of my brain probably decided that I'd die of shock if I became aware of the pain. I swear to God, the world's too damn round, it's impossible to walk straight. Propelling myself from one near fall to the next on a trembling legs, I flee into the night. Good morning, Chiara. Ah, good morning, Chief. Did you get to a good night's sleep? Do I look like I've slept? As if I'd had the time after something like that. I pulled an all-nighter arranging the window dressing for the press. Oh, incidentally, Chief, is it just me or have you lost a little weight? <sighs> I took a look at the scale this morning, three kilos lighter than last week. Oh my, I'm so envious. Sure, it's easy for you to laugh. You got relieved at midnight, went home and took a shower and had a nice bowl of ramen before bed, right? By the way, it's no wonder you're putting on the pound with a diet like that. Okay, why do you know that? <laughs> oh, please, it's hardly a challenge to predict your behavior, dear. How many years do you think I've been doing this job? Oh, man, don't tell me you've installed cameras and mixed in my rooms or something. Sorry, why exactly would I be cutting into my precious 1% of the body to spy on the likes of you? Yeah, I guess you have a point there. More importantly, do we have a fix on 1929's movement after fleeing the scene? Nope, we still got nothing. The last information we received was that un unconfirmed sighting of someone resembling him near Ueno Station at 1 a.m. I see. I guess he might just be lying dead in a ditch somewhere. 
He wasn't trained to roll over and die as easily as that. But according to the public safety, safety officer who responded to the scene, he supposedly received a fatal gunshot wound. And the observers we dispatched to the site confirmed stains suggesting potentially lethal blood loss. But his corpse wasn't found, which means we assume he's alive. Well, I hope you're right. Uh, don't get me wrong, I wasn't trying to imply anything, Chief. I, I didn't mean that I'm rooting for 1929 or anything, uh, and I know you wouldn't shelter him. Yes, I understand that. But really, I wonder where he went. It's not like there's anything anywhere for him to turn to. What about Iris or Marquinez Hospital? Have we posted anyone there? Uh, no, nobody. I mean, the Iris who didn't make any requests to the effort. She's still sleeping in her bed as always. wonder what happens to her now. Who knows? Apparently, Irisu Kiyoka will be flying overseas at 4 this afternoon, taking her daughter Serena with her. They are leaving Makina behind? So long as 1929's death isn't confirmed, I doubt she's eager to take the risk of touching the girl. Ah, our number 1929 is rather stubborn after all. Even if she runs overseas, he'd probably track her to the ends of the earth. Um, wasn't there some saying about 1929's tenacity? What was it again? Being targeted by 1929 is like struggling to push out a turd that just doesn't know when to quit, I believe. Those eloquent words were spoken by the leader of a Cuban narcotic cartel 12 years ago describing the previous 1929. Well, no matter how many times it changes hands, the name 1929 inspires fears. It's our ace number, so to speak. wonder if I'll end up as case officer to a 1929 myself someday. Well, why not? Should the current 1929's death be confirmed and we found ourselves as a new candidate to inherit the number? I don't mind letting you have a try. Uh, really? But I I don't really know if I could handle it. Every I-1929 I, I, we've had gave the CEO nothing but grief, insubordination, rule-breaking, ignoring orders. That's a job that comes with a lot of tears. Come on, it does wonder for the waistline, you know? I don't know. Looking at you, Chief, all I can think is... I don't want to grow old while I'm still young. What exactly does that mean? Uh, come on, I'm just teasing. Whoopsie, an urgent report at a convenient moment. From where? Um, oh, okay, it's just a regular 7.30 report from Idris Omakana's hospital. Shall I read it out? Please do. Um, as of 6.30 this morning, it seems Idris Omakana has regained consciousness. I see, that's good to hear. Apparently she's still rather disoriented, but her vitals are extremely stable. That is a bit of good news, isn't it? Yes, that it is. I'll have to stop by for a little sympathy visit later and inform her of the situation. Don't forget the bum cushion. Indeed, can't forget the bum cushion. Not that I took Chiara's frivolous banter seriously or anything, but I do stop at a western-style cake shop near Yusumakita's hospital to buy a bum cushion prior to my visit that afternoon. When I return to my car, the one sec broadcast on my navigation system is still buzzing with reports concerning the attempted assassination at Irisu Global HQ last night. The contents of the stories are more or less the same, no matter what, I ch what channel I flip to. The crime was the work of a terrorist group of unknown nationality. The ringleader and would-be assassin was quickly overpowered by special police guarding the building, but attempted suicide. And although he was immediately rushed to the hospital, his death was confirmed in the ambulance prior to arrival. It's a shoddy, hackney, hackneyed bit of embroidery, but for some reason, that's just the sort of window dressing the organis organism known as the public is most eager to swallow. Most likely because a story full of holes offers more opportunity to carp about the government's response, it's more entertaining that way. One morning talk show ho has quickly arranged for a special panel discussion featuring an economic analyst who's become a popular early morning talking head recently along with a military commentator who's made a name for himself through comically strident anti-American ravings, frequent oppo opponents currently engaging in a vigorous, spit-spewing exchange of ideas. First of all, please take a look at this slide. This graph demonstrates the trends in the total Irish group revenue over the last 10 years, demonstrating... When you hear the word terrorist, I'm sure everyone immediately thinks of the North or the Middle East, but please don't forget about our good friends in, the, in country C either. I trust you can guess the one I'm referring to. Yes, the second most prideful nation in the world. 
With a quiet snort, I pick up the nav system's remote control and flip from the one sec broadcast back to the GPS screen. Mass media targeted, targeted embroidery type A, plan B. The scenario I prepared is permeating into the public discourse as much as anticipated. In 20 days, a pre-planned shake-up at the Ministry of Justice will become a new hot topic of the moment, and for the majority of the citizens, this incident would be bundled off into a dusty corner of their memory. This chain of incidents has reached a tentative conclusion, but there is still the mystery of I-1929 current whereabouts. And one other problem. Simultaneously, the most trivial and most crucial element of this case also remained unsolved. A mother who fled overseas, leaving her daughter in a hospital, as though abandoning a broken toy she'd grown bored of. The question of how Iris and Magna will be dealt with interests me greatly. The girl hasn't simply been left behind by an indifferent mother. That's only a superficial part of the truth. It would be more accurate to say that we've used the confusion to take control of her as a potential material witness. It proves a wise bet. In compensation for a full accounting of the event that took place last night, Irizu Makina offers me extensive details concerning the Irizu clan's past history of corruption and criminal misconduct. The information in her verbal statements is astoundingly, astoundingly precise, proof that her memories of the family's secret record books remain vivid and clear down to the minutest of details. And so, in form of a young woman, our organization obtains the Irizu clan's Book of the Dead, a prize worthy of all we've spent in its pursuit. The knowledge I gained this afternoon alone would be more than sufficient a bark and chip to seal the Edisu's lips concerning 1929's misconduct. With the addition of one more document to the most classified of files of a secret organization known as CIRS, we immediately extend a guarantee of personal security to our newest resource. The only remaining question would be your future course in life. We'll offer you assistance, our assistance to whatever degree is possible, but do you have any particular aspirations? Hello, dear. Are you listening to me? Her eyes are open wide, and I know she's fully alert, but for the last little while, the girl's simply been staring at the apple seedling sitting by the window with a dopey look in her eyes. Perhaps it would have been best to conceal the fact that Kasami Yuji have disappeared after suffering grave injuries. In combination with his failed assassination of Mark and his own mother, the shock might even prove powerful enough to trigger a relapse of her prior aphasia. Tell me, what are you planning to do now? I'm gonna go home. Go home? To where? The girl no longer has such a thing. Her mother and her sister are gone overseas in search of an organ donor. Her own family wanted her dead. Under such circumstances, who could she possibly return to? There's only one possible answer to my question. I'm going to where Papa is. Papa? Um, which do you mean? Her father in heaven, or that domesticated dog of ours who seems to have fallen off the face of the earth? Well, I suppose it really has to be the latter. We don't have any information about Kasami Yuji's movements as of yet. We promised. Papa promised he'd definitely come pick me up. A promise, eh? Yeah, a promise. So don't worry about me, okay? Just leave me alone and I'll live with Papa from now on. Forever and ever, just the two of us. I'll be just fine. I see. A lonely girl in a hospital bed, dreaming of an ethereal future. Someday the prince will come and carry her away. She truly believes that. And in time the day will come when she can look back on that dream with nostalgia. With this little solitude running through my head, I leave Irisu Makina's hospital's room behind. The evening of that same day I learned that she slipped out of her bed and disappeared quietly from the hospital. Papa's really late. I have the strangest feeling that I've just emerged from a long, long nightmare. I can almost believe that everything was a dream. Being in Mihama Academy, meeting a person named Kasami Yuji, having him become my papa. But the apple seedling in my hands, I can feel it against my palms. In that case, papa wasn't a dream either. I want to believe that. I mean, he promised, right? He totally promised. He'll be here. Papa's definitely gonna show up. I mean, he's never broken a promise to me, not even once. And so I wait in front of the station, an apple tree in my arms. It's already a little past the time we decided on, and a bunch of people have given me funny looks as they walk by, but I don't care one bit. Other people don't scare me anymore. I mean, Papa will be here any minute to pick me up, so what is there to be afraid of? Margina. Papa! 
Sorry, guess I'm a little late. Did you wait long? Yeah, I was waiting, you know. Waiting and waiting this whole time. I see. My bad. Also, I'm sorry. I told you I'd put an end to everything, but I couldn't pull it off. Nah, don't worry. It's okay. It's all over now. All of it. We can run away again, together. As long as you're with me, Papa. That's enough. So let's run away, just the two of us. Go someplace nobody knows us about and live together. Yeah, sounds good. Let's do that. Okay, let's go! Hand in hand, leaning close in our seats, we sway w with the movements of the up and off board bound train. Hey, where are we going? Good question. Any place you want to go, Markina? Um, the sea? The sea, huh? Yeah, I think a beach would be nice. So we go to the beach, and then what? Well, I want to shoot off some fireworks. What else? Oh, I want to play with a puppy. What does that have to do with the beach? Ah, you got a point there. Well, it's fine. We got the money. I haven't touched that 70 million yen you gave me. We can do anything at all. Okay, then. Let's buy ourselves a beach house in the, on the Florida shore. Florida, huh? That a nice place? It's a hell of warm. Ideal for taking it easy. Famous for its seafood and sex. Sounds appealing. I'm a big fan of both. Let's buy ourselves a house by the sea. I started up a bakery on the bottom floor selling my handmade bread. I like that. Hell, we'll get you a puppy and a bicycle too. And at night we can go out and play with fireworks. And, well, let's see what else. We still got plenty of money. Magina, what do, what do you want to do? Mm, I guess, but you know, Papa, right now having you with me is enough. I don't need anything else. I see. Papa? Hmm? What? You're bleeding. Look, on the seat too, and the floor. There's a whole lot. Yep. Truth is, I screwed up a bit, but it's fine. Doesn't hurt that much. When wounds don't hurt, that means they're face on, you know? Yep. Might be. It's getting hard to keep my eyes open. Feels like I'm going to fall asleep. Unless I keep talking. If you fall asleep, you'll die. Papa? Hey. Are you gonna die and leave me all alone again? Please, please don't, please, Papa! So those were the credits, but it's not over yet. One year later. Just as Papa and I had agreed, using the 70 million yen, he returned to me, to, to me as capital. I opened a small bakery in the corner of a small town by the sea. Thank you kindly, don't be a stranger now. There weren't that many customers at first. I mean, the stores kind of popped up out of nowhere and a baker being some random Japanese person probably didn't help. But even so, lately business has been picking up little by little, and I've got a few regulars who've developed a taste for my artisanal mill and bonds. I couldn't have gotten this far on my own. Heck, I wouldn't have thought of trying to open a store in the first place. I got where I am today because a whole lot of people were there for me. More than I ever could would have expected. I'm only here because of their help. And even among them, there's one person I'm particularly grateful to. Morning, marketer. Ah, Papa. Morning. Sleep well last night? Yeah, I've been sleeping a lot better lately. Anywho, take a load off. I'll make some coffee, okay? Yeah, appreciate it. I'm glad. You're looking so much better lately. I seriously thought you were gonna die that day, you know? <laughs> to hear JP tell it, I'm not a sweet enough mutt to roll over and die that easily. But you did lose your right arm and all. Well, what are you gonna do? The bones and muscle in my shoulder were totally pulverized, so the arm was basically dangling off a bit of skin. I knew it was, going to, it was gone the instant I got a decent look. When I was changing clothes in the station bathroom after being shot, I even considered just ripping the thing off and leaving it behind. Decided against it though. No reason to give some poor janitor a heart attack. Okay, yeah, but did you really have to wrap the thing up with packaging tape packaging from a convenience store? You have no idea how many times I upchucked while giving you the first aid. True enough. Sorry about that. 
Nah, I'm the one who should be apologizing. I mean, you did all that for me. I really am sorry. It's fine. Feels like a lot bit of a lucky break, if anything. Small price to pay for a divorce from the devil. Anyway, Parker, you, you picked a good time to come over. There aren't any customers, so why don't we have breakfast? Yeah, I'm actually starving. You've been cleaning your plate a lot more often than lately. Makes me a little happy to see that, you know? Hmm? Oh, it's the phone. Hold on a sec, Papa. Hello? This is Makina speaking. 1929, you have a job. What the heck? It's just stupid old Chiara. What are you calling me up for the first thing in the morning, girl? It's an emergency. A vehicle will be coming to pick you up in 30 minutes. Make your preparations. Screw that! You do it! I'll own you my rifle, okay? I ain't even had breakfast yet! Uh, okay, look, I haven't eaten anything myself for your information. Just get ready, alright? I swear to God, if there's some law the number 1929 can only be passed on to a complete pig-headed bracket or what? Don't get all grumpy, you'll stop menstruating. You two do remember who's making that happy-go-lucky beach bakery lifestyle of yours possible, yes? Alright, fine. I know. Message received. You want me to work, I work. I take the job seriously. Swear that to the stars and stripes, please. Yeah, yeah, I swear on the flag. You have 27 minutes. Get to the standby position with C-type equipment. Roger. You going? Yeah, some job came up all of a sudden. Sorry about that. Will you be okay by yourself? Not a problem. I'm pretty used to the artificial arm by now. Making coffee shouldn't be an issue. Okay then. I'm heading out for a bit. Don't screw up, kid. Indeed. Won't be a problem. Leave it all to me. Oh, that's right. Can I borrow your loophole, Papa? What? Again? No one's breaking them. You'll be fine. Come on, please. Fine. Take it. Woohoo! Spanks ya! I'll be back in a jiffy. After strapping the case of my beloved L96A1AWS into my folding aluminium card, I carefully tied down a smaller box containing the scope I successfully bummed off for Papa. Then set off for the neighborhood parking lot where my ride will arrive, pulling the rattling cart along the ground behind me. The sun in Florida is ridiculously strong. When I turn my sunglass clad eyes up to the sky, the fat old ball of fire blazes down on my face, scorching my cheeks. Looks like another nice day's brewing. On days like this, the air is crisp and dry with low humidity, so the bullets fly nice and steady. I'm thinking dead center on the first shot, for sure. Coming to a new town, I'm starting a new job at my bakery. I also picked up a new part-time position. Specifically, I'm starting to take over Papa's work, now that he's retired from his injuries and all. It's a lot of new stuff to deal with at once, and I'm still in the awkward getting used to it phase, but on the whole, I'm finding this new life of mine pretty fulfilling. Yep, pretty dang fulfilling indeed. Can't say as my life really got off to that great a start, but right now every day seems fun. Maybe it's because I can do all sorts of stuff now that I couldn't do before. Best part is, I'm pretty sure tomorrow's gonna be fun too. And the day after that. And a whole lot of days after that. If that ain't happiness, what is? Protecting this tranquil little lifestyle is my number one objective now. 1929, I've arrived. Acknowledged. But now I'm used to having her having her cut the line on me after a single word. There's a whole lot of things I've got to do in order to keep this happy life of mine rolling along. But it's no biggie. My head isn't hurting today. Not yet. Alright then, let's do this thing! Firing myself up a little, I look up into the sky once again. A flock of seagulls soar by overhead. I take off my sunglasses, retrieve a small bottle from a pocket and apply my eye drops. Closing my eyes, I listen to the waves breaking softly on the shore. And that's the actual end. So, Yuji didn't die, and everything actually turned out alright. And, um, as proclaimed, that's the end of Machina's story. And the end of the Machina's branch. However, there are more girls, more branches to cover. And we shall do so in the next episode where we shall continue from before we chose to become Machina's papa. But, until then, take... Yeah.